This is That's What I Call Marketing with your host, Connor Byrne. Welcome to That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you will hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Don't forget to rate or review our episodes wherever you are listening or watching. It really helps us reach and build on this amazing community of engaged marketers just like you. And if you're interested in getting involved with That's What I Call Marketing, our sponsorship kit is now available on our website. Visit that's what I call marketing.com forward slash sponsor. Well, today I am joined by Chief Revenue Officer of Calendly, Jessica Gill Martin. And yes, we did schedule today's episode using Calendly. I saw Jessica speak at the Festival of Marketing during COVID and really connected with her presentation as I was doing a very similar job at the time, leading a global marketing team. We connected at the time and when Jessica moved to Calendly, she said she would come onto the podcast, but needed time to settle in first. And it won't surprise you when you listen to the episode that Jessica Gilmartin is a person who sticks to her word. Today, we cover so much in a fascinating and fun conversation that is a great insight, not just for marketers, but for salespeople too. So if you're a marketer working with salespeople, send them on this episode. So some great insights for them. We discussed the ways Jessica found support and mentorship on her pretty unconventional career journey. We talk about the importance of finding passion, maintaining intellectual curiosity, and the constant evolution of marketing as a discipline. We go deep on the topic of international marketing, highlighting the necessity of understanding how to cut through the noise and understand what really matters and where and when to get really local. Something that Diplomat Agency has been set up to support scaling companies with. Jessica is a leader that oozes empathy and we talk about her approach to creating a supportive culture as a leader, being a thoughtful leader and not having all the answers. We cover product-led growth, insights in how best to align sales and marketing and practical advice for any salespeople out there trying to target CMOs. You're probably getting it all wrong. And we also uncover something that we can't tell Jessica's boss about. I hope you enjoy this episode, which will start after a quick word from our show's sponsors. Today's show is supported by The Indie List, the leader in providing you with easy access to hundreds of highly experienced marketers quickly and cost effectively. Visit theindielist.ie to speak to the Indie List team today. Are you facing the maze of global expansion? Diplomat introduces the diplomacy model a cost-effective, innovative approach to navigating the complexities of your brand's presence in international markets. Visit Diplomat.agency. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Jessica, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. Very happy to be here. Listen, first of all, We are recording this on International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day. And I just saw your post uh, that you've put out on LinkedIn. And by the time this goes out, it may have passed. But I thought it was wonderful offering the the help maybe that you got through your career by saying you want to, you know, offer time with people and give them advice. So anyway, just want to start with that. That was a, a wonderful way to start an International Women's Day. Thank you. Yeah, it was my social media manager's idea. And she uh, she convinced me that people would actually want to set up and talk to me. So hopefully that's the case. Uh, but but yes, I mean, I, um, I've been very, very fortunate to have so many people, both men and women, um, who have been mentors to me, and have helped me so much. And I think as I, um, I'm 20 years into my career, and one of the things that really means so much more to me now is to help um, the younger generation, you know, really understand how they can be successful. It's so much more fulfilling for me now to help others than it is about my own career. Yeah, amazing. Well, listen, going into kind of the, without the full potted history of the career, I was kind of looking back and you feel like you had a fascinating path to to where you are now. Like I was looking back, you, you were in Lehman Brothers, you were brand manager at Dell, you set up a specialty food business. There was in there, then there was also the MBA in marketing. So like, was marketing something that you kind of had a passion for and, you know, that you really always wanted to do? Uh, yeah. So I was joking. I had the weirdest background ever and nobody should ever follow my career path. But I think mean, that's the fun thing is that everybody has their own path and you shouldn't. It's the thing that I always say, which is you should look at anybody else's career. You should look at anybody else and just do what you love. 
Um, so, so yeah, I started as an investment banker mainly because I didn't know how many career paths were out there. I went to Cornell, which is a, um, a school in, in New York, and it's a huge feeder school to consulting and investment banking and finance. So that kind of just, for me, was something that, that made a lot of sense at the time. And I really didn't have exposure to other parts of the business. I just knew that I wanted to do something different than finance. I didn't know what it was. So I went to business school really as the opportunity to do that reset and to learn about other components of the business. And the first time I took a marketing class, for me, it was a eureka moment. I realized right. this was what I wanted to do. It was that uh, marrying of creativity and data um, mm. that I think it's, every good marketer should have. And that really kind of set me on the path. That's uh, fascinating. And I, I love hearing uh, like everyone's path kind of because I think it's so inspiring for anybody, even people listening today who might be starting out. Because I know, you know, there's marketing students listen to this podcast and actually understanding that the path can take de many different forms to get you to where the end destination is and it may not be where you expect it to be. You know, I always thought I'd be a hotel manager. <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I think the to me, the most important thing, and you know, maybe we'll talk about this in a bit, but it's about finding um, things that you love to do, things that you're passionate about and, and places where you'll make an impact. And that's what I've always focused on and, um, and really being a constant lifelong learner, just being really intellectually curious, wanting to discover new things. The thing that makes me happiest in a day is when I learn something new. Because I think, gosh, I, I, I know something now that I didn't know yesterday. And how great is that? Um, and I think that that's sort of how I've always lived my life and how I've always made my choices. I love, I, uh, yeah, I talk about curiosity so much when I talk to people on this podcast. I, I, I worry sometimes that I frustrate people because it comes up so often. But I, like, I'm so with you. I think that, you know, curiosity to learn and, and never think that you have the answers is so important and being discovering new things. Yes. And especially marketing. I think the reason I, one of the reasons I love marketing so much is that it changes, I think, more than any other discipline in business. And, you know, the things that worked even a year ago or two years ago don't work as well now. And, and we're just discovering all these new things that will work. And, um, and so I think being a lifelong learner, being intellectually curious, talking to other people out there and learning what they're doing and being willing to scrap the things that you're doing, I think that to me is the, is the critical part and critical component of being successful in marketing. Yeah, the the concept of, you know, this is how we do it. Just, it doesn't, you know, it, it can't always work. There's ways, the things that you have done. I, I was saying that to someone today. It's like, you know, this is what we have done. It's a much better way of saying, the, you know, the same idea versus this is what we do. Because I don't think yes. the second one works. Um, I remember I saw you, I think, I think you presented or were on a panel, possibly presented at the Festival of Marketing in London. Gosh, mm -hmm. it's three, four years ago now, I think. Um, yeah. And at the time you were in your role in Asana and you were responsible for international marketing. I think I have that right. And I remember listening to you and I was doing uh, EMEA marketing at the time. And I remember just sitting there listening. Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, this is exactly, yes, the same challenge, the same thing I was not. And I sent you a message afterwards in LinkedIn and I was like, oh my gosh, I just, everything you were saying resonated uh, with me so, so much. And one of the things that you talked about was the, 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 the challenge, I guess, and the balance between global marketing, doing things at scale or that can scale, but also getting the local nuance Right. And, and that, like, it's a huge, huge challenge. I'd love to kind of dig into that a bit with you and just kind of, you know, understand even now, but like your approach to it then and what you were, you know, the things you face as challenges and how you try to overcome them. Because I think a lot of international marketers face this, this hurdle. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, I actually gave that presentation. It was the height of COVID. And I remember recording it in my bedroom because I didn't have an office yet. So Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it because I, I wouldn't say that it was the most conducive to the best uh, best presenting. Um, literally, I had my laptop propped up on my dresser, uh, giving it the, <laughs> the glamour. <laughs> it was so glamorous, um, but but yeah, I, I um, you know having done that for almost three years, and, and obviously having worked in, in many companies, Google, uh, and I did uh, I really supported our international mobile business there. 
Um, it is extremely difficult. And everybody that works internationally knows that. And what has been really interesting, especially I interviewed so many marketers that came from larger companies that had centralized their international mm -hmm. marketing. And pretty clear to me, having talked to them, that that just model just doesn't work um, or doesn't work as well as trying to create this hybrid centralized, decentralized model. And it's really tricky. Yeah. And we struggled a lot of what are the uh, you know, what are the the systems? What are the processes? What are the people that make sense to centralize? Because it definitely makes sense to centralize some things um, like, you know, uh, marketing automation. It makes a lot of sense to centralize that because it requires just a lot of specialized knowledge. Yeah. And it does require scale, but they have to work with all the regional marketers to understand, as you talked about, the nuances and the language and the you know local case studies and just all of the things that make these big differences in marketing, you know, little things make really big differences. And if you are, you know, if, if a, a French customer is getting emails that are, you know, show up talking about American case studies and link to English, you know, documents, yeah. that could be the difference between them clicking and learning more or not. And, you know, it's, and, and you magnify that and multiply that by every country and every language. It's it's very complicated, but it's really important to get that that nuance right. Yeah, and it's also you know like there's there's so many small I think cultural differences, but then there's so many big things that are the same. I like I often say to people, you know, I'm based in Ireland, and if you say to somebody in Ireland, you're very like people in the UK, we'd be like, oh no, we're not. We're so different, you know. And then in yeah. Ireland, it's like. Dublin and Cork people, you know, two different parts of the country are so different. And so there's, you know, there's always going to be differences that you can find, but then you have to find or look for the ones that are, that are true and meaningful because otherwise you'll end up changing everything as opposed to the important things. Did you have a kind of a system of, I guess, not blocking out the noise, but really figuring out like what were the things that really mattered and were, were different? I, I think ultimately everything in marketing comes down to the customer and customer centricity. And so when I think about, you know, what, what does it mean to, what's the, what's the chaff from the wheat? To me, the wheat is the customer and it, it is, how do we understand our customers? How do we speak their language? How do we promote the local customers? How do we even make sure that the people that we are showcasing look like them? I yeah. mean, that, that was a really big issue in Asana. Um, and it's a big issue everywhere, which is, you know, just to be really honest, if you are, you know, if you're in, in an Asian country, you should not have, you know, um, you should not have all your photo shoots in San Francisco. Yes. And I think that that is something that's a really common mistake. People need to go to a site and feel like this company understands them and they understand. And, and also, for example, in Japan, you know, they are, most of their um, larger companies are manufacturing. And so if you are talking about technology, you're talking about healthcare, you're talking about retail, it's not going to resonate. And so it has to come down to understanding the local customers um, and then speaking their language. I think everything else to me is just kind of noise. Yeah. And it's not like, that's really great because translation is a thing you can do, right? It's easy to get stuff translated. Easier now, yes. probably. Yes, very easy. <laughs> but actually getting to, you know, even style of film and photography can look really, really different, you know, and it's hard to explain that, I think, sometimes. That's a real challenge, I think, for in-market marketers of trying to explain that to a centralized marketing function without sounding like you're being annoying. Totally. And, and I've been going back to Japan just because I think they have the most extreme cultural differences versus the U.S. And so one thing that I always found fascinating was that, you know, in Japan, my Japanese marketers, marketers insisted that customers wanted to watch 45 minute detailed product videos. I mean, can you imagine yeah. if in the US or in the UK, you tried to create a 45 minute detailed product video, but you know, the two minute little fluffy videos that we like to create with music and sort of, you know, quick shots that just doesn't work in other languages, in other countries, because they don't see that they, they want to get more detail and they don't see that it's credible. And so it's those kind of things that are really important to understand. And if, if we just had this uh, which I think most companies do, this centralized brand team and design team and creative team creating all the assets and just translating it, you know, that that's not success to me. That's not going to generate what you want because it's just culturally totally different and, and not having that empathy and not having that understanding, I think is a big miss. 
Yeah. And there was a report out um, a couple of months ago from Cantor that said, I think it's something like after kind of within two or three markets, work that you try to make internationally starts to become less and less effective. So you may get lucky. You know, you may, excuse me, you may make something in the US that will work in the UK and Netherlands. We found that actually a lot. that The Netherlands was very responsive to the US work and the UK reasonably. But once you try to go beyond that, like, you know, into France or, you know, the, the resistance, Germany was fascinating because it was just like, it was oh, yeah. wildly different. You know, we had to do wildly. everything. And like even understanding things like media is so much more expensive there. Like going in, you don't know that. And it's like, I'm giving away all the hints yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that we discovered is that we really needed um, feet on the ground in all of the local regions. So we had, you know, we had media buyers in region. We had creatives in region. Yeah. And those that made a dif- difference. And even obviously events, which are a huge driver for most, especially on the B2B side. Um, we needed somebody in Germany say, these are the events. Um, and, you know, this, these are the buyers. Because there's no way you could possibly tell that from the US. No. Yeah. Because you're doing like it's the, the desk research. You need that that local market knowledge. And we saw, actually, I saw it in Italy incredibly in Indeed again, where, you know, we'd done stuff from Dublin, a uh, wonderful colleague, Alma, and she figured out so much, but it got to a critical point. And even she recognized that to get to, get to the next level, we needed that local market insight to know, actually, we need to be here, here and here. And, you know, Marina's there now doing an incredible job, but like that's, it's, it's also like knowing those moments as well of having kind of like, okay, when do you unlock that? you know, in-market person? Because you can't do it from the beginning, I don't believe. No, you definitely can't. And again, it, it, um, one thing that we've definitely learned is that you have to do everything in lockstep. So you really have to say, you know, we are going to do the marketing investment and the sales investment and the customer support investment together. Um, and ideally, even the product investment, because there definitely are product investments you should meet if you're going to localize. And I think one of, the, one of the challenges I definitely have seen other folks make is they, kind of do one without the other. So you, you put the sales in, but yeah. you don't put the marketing in. And then the sales are kind of starving and saying, hey, where's where's the marketing? You know, where's our where's our air cover? Yeah. Um, and uh, or you put the marketing in, you don't have the sales in and then you haven't figured out, uh, you know, what what does that sales process look like? And, you know, do you have only people in California, salespeople, and then someone in Germany is trying to set up a meeting, but they can't and nobody speaks the language. And so it, it requires just a level of uh, integration between all of the functions to make sure that you are um, building things at the same time and commensurate with the investment that that you're all making and and that the company thinks is valuable for you know for growth. Yeah, and that kind of opportunity of the markets and you know understanding it and you know you can make wrong decisions because you can ha- if you don't have all those things working together you've got well actually. Our sales aren't working in market X because, but we don't have all the other bits that are going to help them, you know, and help them perform. And finally, kind of on that international marketing, we'll maybe touch on it again. But the, you know, one of the things I I thought was there would be a, there would be a playbook. I thought, (laughs) so (laughs) when I started working on the kind of emerging markets and we, we did stuff in Italy and we kind of did, we did stages, we did things with stages and things started to work. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. Like, I'll just do this everywhere. And it, it just didn't work that way. Like you, you can't, unfortunately, replicate the same things. There are bits probably you can, but did you have the same experience or did you, were you better than me? <laughs> you got a playbook working. Right. No, I mean, we figured it all out right away and it was perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, um, and again, that goes back to having a learning mindset and having empathy and trusting and asking a lot of questions. Uh, so, you know, we definitely found that there were some things that translated. And one thing that was really important to me, even though my team was on seven different time zones around the world, it was really important for us to get together so we could share yeah. those learning because there were maybe 20 to 30 percent of things that were really interesting and that people could learn. And particularly, you know, UK and Australia, obviously, culturally, there were there are some similarities yeah. there. Uh, but I'd say, you know, 70 to 80 percent of things were really bespoke. And um, we, we tried and failed a lot. And that was just the reality is that we tried a lot of things and some things worked really well, some things didn't. And we could never guess why things would work and why things didn't. And we would, you know, say, oh, one thing works super well in the UK, let's try it in France and it didn't work. And it's just the reality is culturally they're yeah. incredibly di- different and you just have to respect that, understand that. Yeah. Consumers never do what you want them to do. 
<laughs> Honey, they don't. They do not. So frustrating. Um, I, part of that then is kind of, I guess, the culture. You talked about a few things there, like, you know, curiosity, you know, trying things. And, and I know you're now at Calendly and um, joined as CMO. And you, you, I heard you say that, you know, when you joined, it was kind of your, you felt your role was to kind of create the right culture and conditions for the team to succeed. I'd love to kind of hear a bit about your approach to creating the culture and the conditions for, for teams. Because I hear a lot of CMOs talk about doing that, but like practically, how do you go about doing it? Yes. So um, a few things. So uh, my CMO at Asana, I loved what he said and I have completely taken this from him and I think he took this from somebody else. And so when work do that, we take things yeah. uh, from, from others, other work owners. But you know, he said it, he said a good CMO does three things. They know the people, they know the data and they know the story. And that, and I really have taken that to heart and, and it, it always comes back to the people. So I think for me, the number one condition to try to make people successful is to make people feel safe and make people feel heard um, and um, hold people to really high standards, but in the most caring, kindest, most empathetic way. That's really number one. Uh, and so you always have to start with people and understanding uh, people. So understanding what the roles are, mm -hmm. what roles do we need? Are people in the right roles? Do we Have we over-invested in some areas? Have we not invested in others? Um, so when I joined Calendly, I met with every single solitary person on my team. It almost killed me. It took me a month of almost nonstop meetings. But that was incredibly important to me because I knew that I was going to be enacting a lot of change. I knew that I would be really right. trying to transform the team. And I needed people to know me as someone that was not just this person, especially we're remote. They literally, you know, went and met me. So they need them to see me as, as a human being okay. that yeah. cared about them and saw them. So that was like number one. Um, and number two, I got so much insight. You know, I just asked a lot of questions about their role and their job and what was frustrating to them. I kind of call it my magic wand moments because I say, you know, hey, if I had a magic wand, what would you fix? And I got so much unbelievable um, feedback that I never would have gotten otherwise. It was just filtered through the four or five people that I interact with. Most. Yeah. yeah. So that's the number one thing is just focusing on the people. The number two thing is data and just, you know, what, what do we have? How do we understand our business? What data do we need to have to understand our business? Um, most companies I've been at don't have nearly enough data, nearly enough reporting. Um, and so creating a data culture uh, and then figuring out how do we, uh, how do we understand what the numbers are? But most importantly, how do we set goals and how do we set really clear goals that everybody understands what success looks like? So super, super important. And then finally, the story, which is, you know, what is Cali? What do we stand for? What do we stand for with our customer? How are we differentiated? Um, how do we make sure that we continue to tell this differentiated story in the marketplace? Um, and where are potentially are we lacking? Where do we want to go? And a lot of that is actually talking to customers, talking to our board, talking to other executives. Um, they have so much insight. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I spent my first sort of, you know, 45 to days or so. Wow. As you say, like a lot of, a lot of getting into the the, the trenches and how do you, I, there's a couple of things there with that because I, you know, you know, when you like the coming the new CMO, you know, people might be a bit, was there nervousness or anxious? Did, did you, how were you able to get to the honesty quickly? Because, do you know what I mean? Cause I'm sure they were shorter enough meetings. People were very nervous. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and I would say it, people definitely were not all honest with me. And I also think that that comes what I, have, what I have realized is that there are very few cultures where honesty and directness are rewarded. Yeah. And it makes me incredibly sad. And really, it, it just really disappoints me that people feel scared to be honest because they are afraid of retaliation. And it's yeah. extremely clear that uh, that is the case in most companies. And to be really honest, I still have that issue with my team. Um, it doesn't matter how many times I talk about um, uh, being open and facilitate that. I even have brought in um, outside uh, consultants to help us work through how do we give feedback? How do we receive feedback? How do we create a culture of honesty? Um, people still have a hard time with it. And so I, it's something that I just emphasize over and over again. And one of the big things I do is I just live it, right? So yeah. I am extremely open. I'm extremely direct. I'm extremely transparent. I over communicate. And so I try to just lead by example. And I know a lot of my employees um, 
listen to my podcast. So hopefully they listen to this <laughs> and it gets reinforced in, in a lot of these um, you know, podcasts and interviews that I do because it is, to me, the only ways that organizations can succeed is if people feel psychologically safe to be open, be transparent, make mistakes, admit to the mistakes, um, and then come together and figure figure out how to make each other better. Yeah, I, and look, I completely agree. And I think I've, I've seen both sides of it. And I've seen instances where actually it's not necessarily the CMO, but it can be between the team and the CMO that there's people who are like, don't create that culture and share it. I'm not saying that's the instance you have, but I've yeah. seen that. But I've also seen the other side where, you know, I remember like that, that honesty and just being really honest. One of my very first presentations to Paul Darcy, who was our CMO at the time when I started on Indeed, we had to go and present at a quarterly review and we had, we had nothing. He had no wins. He had no learnings. And I remember we were sitting there and we were going, oh, what are we, what are we going to do? And we were like, well, we write, this is a win. And then we were looking, that's not a win. Like, don't even, like, let's not pretend. And so, but that actually gave us, because we did it and he was like, okay, you know, maybe it'd be nice to see something the next time. But it, there was no retaliation. And I always remember that. And, and that's kind of something that's really, really, really important to to do, to, to have that. Um, so much more to get into there, but I just want to touch on um, kind of the evolution of your role already. You're now CRO. And okay. so now you look after sales and marketing. Am, am I right? Yes. Okay. So did you have to do the same thing again when you got the new extra responsibility? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it was even worse for sales because just like other companies, you know, we, we unfortunately had to do some layoffs and, and a reorganization and, um, and it was a very close knit group and it was really difficult. And, um, I was extraordinarily lucky because our sales team had built a really strong culture and we had phenomenal leaders in place already. But obviously me coming in as this person that they knew as a CMO and taking over that role, um, you know, understandably you know, kind of skeptical mm -hmm. and just, I think a little shell shocked by when it happened. And for me, the most important thing for them was to feel like they were supported and feel like they were being set up for success. And so um, I was, we were fortunate that our big company kickoff was, you know, a couple of weeks after the reorganization. And so we all were able to come together and okay. I spent a lot of time with the team, a lot of time one-on-one -on -one, um, and really making sure that they understood why we did it um, and how we had crafted this, the new roles and the new team in a way that would set them up for success and then not just show up one time, but continue to show up. And so, you know, um, Bo, who's, who's my head of sales, who's absolutely wonderful, you know, he and I spent a lot of time together thinking about you know, what is the communication strategy? What is the, what are the ways that we're going to continue over and over and over again to make sure that this team feels supported? And it's not just words, it's deeds. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the most important thing. And that's what I'd say to, to every single person who's listening, who's in a leadership position. It's not about the words that you use. It's about taking action and taking decisive action. Uh, because a lot of people can say things, but um, again, it goes back to this magic wand moment. So one of the things that I knew was that we have a uh, deal process that kind of a deal appro approval process that doesn't work well. And it's been really frustrating for the team for a long time. And so I said, I, my very first meeting with them, I said, I absolutely promise you this will be fixed in six months. And I swear to you. And I, um, put a ta tiger team on it. The first thing that I did, and we're already, we're, you know, two months in and they're already most of the way to solving it. Wow. And, um, and we continue to give updates and, you know, those kind of things mean a lot because they're, they're looking, they're saying, yes, you, you do care, you do understand, um, and you are making a difference. And those are just, just find those wins, find those tangible wins and find ways to demonstrate that you care and that you're actively doing something. Today's show is brought to you by the Indie List CMO Collective. This service from the Indie List provides you with access to a curated range of highly experienced and talented senior marketing specialists. Visit the IndieList.ie to find out more. I th like that I th think the caring is such a thing isn't it like you know just actually like busy lots of pressure and all you know that comes with the role but actually being human and having that caring and even for the difficult decisions and conversations you and others probably had to have with people I think even you know maybe the people who 
had left the business, how they were treated on the way out, I think, and afterwards is really, really important. And I think there's great examples of people who've done it well and examples of people who've done it really, really poorly, you know, and I think it's, it's testament to leaders who can, you know, stand up and kind of go, do you know what? I, 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 I acted with dignity when, in those moments. I think that's really important. It's great to, great to hear that kind of caring coming, coming through. My only job is to make sure that I have a high performing team. That is my job. I don't actually do work. <laughs> and right? No, I don't, I don't do work. Um, but I, I manage a lot of people that do work yeah. and I make sure that they're doing well. And so my job is to hire great people and retain them and keep them happy. And it's not only my job. I mean, it's my calling. It's the thing that I get up every day to do. Yeah. And the thing that keeps me really satisfied and engaged in my role is looking at other people that are early in their career who are high performing and care. Um, and when I have the opportunities to, you know, to, to provide a culture that enables them to be successful and enables them to progress in their career. I mean, I, I don't know why somebody wouldn't find that satisfying. Yeah. Someone wouldn't want to focus on that. Yeah. And, and the knock on effect, I think in the world that that has, like you talked at the start about, you know, people who were helped you and guided you and were good to you along the way and that, you know, you can do that and, you know, thinking of people who, you know, in whatever period of time will think back and remember, oh, Jessica did that to help help me. It's like, it's a wonderful, I guess, legacy for want of a better word, isn't it? Like it's a lovely, you know, we can be in for-profit companies and still do good things. I, I, I genuinely believe that's pos- possible. Of course. I mean, I, you know, one of the reasons I love Cali, the reason I love Dasana is that people love our product. Mm -hmm. You know, know, I just, no, like literally no matter where I go, it does not matter where I go in the world. uh, When I tell people what I do, it is inevitable. They just say, I love Cali, I use it. And they tell me how it has helped them to be successful. I mean, there's just not much better than that. um, Knowing that the thing, the product that you are selling is helping other people pay their bills and feed their families. I mean, that's, a great thing. Absolutely. And listen, talking about Calendly, because I've heard you say as well that, you know, like it's a, ca- it's created a category and probably, you know, someone saying, I'm scheduling. Like, you know, not that maybe yeah. the, it doesn't sound like the sexiest thing in, yeah. in the world, but like it's phenomenally useful, functional, but a lot of people enter it through, through the free product, right? You know, I can use Calendly for free yeah. and that's how a lot of people know it. So is it, is it like it's a product like growth company approach, right? Would that be a huge part of your marketing efforts is like the product led growth? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're very fortunate in that we have such a strong brand name and we kind of are the default in scheduling. Uh, so most of the growth that we have is organic, but we obviously have a very, you know, we have, we have a pretty robust uh, paid generation, demand generation team who are focused on, you know, sort of finding the right folks. Um, and we have kind of two different motions. We have a sign up motion. So they're really focused on finding, you know, those folks that are not only just signing up, but hopefully have a higher propensity to convert to um, happy paying users over a long period of time. Then we also have an ABM marketing approach that is really supporting our sales team and really thinking about how do we find those customers that are already in the market um, or even looking at our existing customers and saying, how do we support the sales team in doing marketing efforts to drive expansion. Um, so those are really two of our big pay generation efforts. But of course, you know, one thing that we have seen so much over the past couple of years is the rise of influencers and social yeah. um, and just generally people buying and learning about Calendly completely outside of the sales cycle. And so, you know, really all so many of our teams are focused on how do we get great content out there? Um, how do we across all the channels? Um, so that if people are making buying decisions without us, um, we are there with really high quality content. Yeah. And it's like, it's interesting because people will say, I'll send you a Calendly. Like, yes. like any company starting out would be like, if I get to that point, like, yes. <laughs> that is amazing. But then competition comes with that, right? Because you're the, you're the market leader. How do you stay ahead? And again, I heard you say kind of, you, you try not to spend too much time thinking about the competition, but at the same time, to be able to differentiate yourself from your product, you kind of have to know what they're up to. Yeah. One of our board members said it to me perfectly, which is being competitor aware, but not competitor obsessed. And that's something that I 
tell my team a lot because they, when I joined, they definitely were, I think, more competitor obsessed. And I think that that was just a byproduct of a you know, sort of previous culture. Um, but if you only are focused on what your competitors are doing, you're never thinking about your customers. You're not thinking about right. how do you provide the, the, the most benefit for your customers. And so the thing that we we do, and I, we have an amazing product work-based solution marketing team, content marketing team, they're all fantastic, is you know, they're spending so much time with our customers and understanding what is our true differentiation and then building all of our content on our differentiation. And of course, we've got fantastic competitive marketing team that are you know, arming our sales team with battle cards. And we have, yeah. you know, web pages like everybody else that has, you know, us versus competitors. But I just, you know, I, it's not something that I focus on. It's not something that I spend a lot of time on. It's important. But the most important thing is for us to continue to innovate, continue and, and continue to do what we can to educate the market about how we are more than a scheduling link. And we actually had a whole campaign last year um, that was literally said Calendly more than a scheduling link. It was very literal um, <laughs> because we, we wanted people to ask the question, okay, great, what are you? Yeah. you know, and, and that really opens up the opportunity to talk about all the very, very advanced features. And I think that that's a really interesting challenge in marketing. Um, and especially when you have a company who everybody knows, uh, which is everybody knows us for one thing. We have 50 things. Yeah. How do you tell that? story in the right places at the right time. Like that, I definitely wanted to ask you about that because that that is a huge challenge. Again, you know, you've created a category. People say, I'll send you a Calendly. And then you're like, but hang on, we do all these other things. Yeah. How do you not get, or how do you avoid the temptation to go out and say everything about everything <laughs> you have yeah. all at once? Yeah. I, I do think that that's the huge benefit of how buyers buy now, which is they, they're they educated buyers and they do their research before they come to you. Yeah. And so really the goal for me is, you know, to make sure you have really strong SEO, to make sure that you have really strong content that when somebody is, for example, somebody is uh, Googling, you know, team-based scheduling, we need to be there and talking about all the great features that we have for team-based scheduling. Or when someone's talking about website routing, we need to be there from an ad perspective, from a content perspective, on review sites. You know, people need to see that we are, you know, we're, we're like number one in G2. That's not by accident. You know, we do a lot of work to make sure that um, we have created, educated, uh, you know, great materials on G2, that we have lots of great reviews, that our customers talk about us and explain the differences between us and our competition. So it's just really thinking about the places that customers are looking for us and trying to find information and making sure that we have really great content relevant for that piece and not trying to throw everything but the kitchen sink. Because yes. that's not how people are, you know, people are typically thinking, I need routing and team-based scheduling and round web scheduling and scheduling. Like say, and, and then you would make, be making a giant mess. So yeah, yeah we don't do that. Uh, and you, <laughs> look, we, people do do it. Uh, so it's good, it's good to hear you. Um, customers are clearly so central to I prefer to say maybe your marketing beliefs in a way that like the you know without knowing the customer but also you know in how maybe you're structuring things at Calendly like to me it sounds like if there's not a customer insight or customer insights there we shouldn't be doing it would that be fair yes 100 percent and and we it's actually one of the best things about bringing sales and marketing together is how much more insight we get from our sales team about yeah. our customers Nobody knows our customers better than the people that engage with them every single day. So that would be our, you know, our customer support, our um, CSMs, so our, basically our relationship managers and our AEs. And you know, so I, my goal is to make sure that our marketers are hearing from them. They listen to sales calls. Yeah. Um, we actually have this fantastic um, consultant that interviews a lot of our uh, deals that we either won or lost, and they put together summaries that publish to the company so everybody can read why we win and lose deals. We have a customer Slack channel where anybody that has engaged with a customer can talk about, you know, what happened and why they chose Calendly and, and maybe the use cases. So these are all really important ways that we become sort of customer obsessed. We really focus on understanding our customers. I think it's even more important in a PLG business because we don't have one persona. We have hundreds of them. Yeah. And trying to understand all of the different personas, all the use cases, how do we create materials that resonate for each of them? Um, it's 
dramatically harder than in sort of a, a more traditional enterprise marketing. That's amazing. I love that Slack channel idea because that's so simple to well, mm-hmm. implement, you know, say, look, put it here. And, and I love also the the losses, like, you know, it sounds terrible. I love losses, but you know, why, why things don't happen uh, are so important, aren't they? Because you, there's, there's insight, like there's so much rich territory there. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I, I read it and, and it's, it's very rarely something self-inflicted. It's a lot of it is, you know, we just didn't have this feature or, uh, you know, you know the, the buying cycle wasn't right. Um, you know, it just, there's, there's so many, so much rich information there or like, the the champion was really bought in, but they couldn't get um, buying buying authority. And they couldn't get budget, and so just understanding those and thinking, okay, how do we then create materials, or how do we create uh, ROI um, studies? Like, what are the things that we can do in the future to mitigate this? Yeah, and we had that, that previously as well, where we had we knew there was partners selling our product, but they were also selling other products, and we were failing in markets where we were less known because. We weren't setting them up for success. So we created, we had all the content. We just didn't give them access to it. So we actually gave them access to all the content that we gave our salespeople. Because we were like, if we're not in the room, how can we be in the room with them? And that was kind of the idea of kind of, you know, creating that. But it only came from sales saying to us, we've done this. This is a true problem, right? And not kind of not noise. Not yeah, 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 exactly. It was all there. It just wasn't being yeah. used. Um, yeah, that was a big um, that was a big lesson for us too with Asana when we started uh, scaling up our international partner program. Is we had a fantastic partner marketer, but really having them treat our partners as if they were salespeople that was a it took us a, too long to figure that out. But once we did that, was extraordinarily helpful. Yeah, totally unlocks unlocks growth. Um, we talked maybe towards the start about how things are very different and things change, like in marketing, like year on year, you know. And I've heard you say that 70, 80%, 70 to 80% of what you do each quarter is is different. Is yeah. that is that right? Yes. Um, I'm sure my team is listening and saying, yes, no, it's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jessica. Yeah. So, so there's, uh, yeah, and, and and people always ask me about this because, um, and, and to be clear, what I don't do is sort of show everybody around and like every quarter there is a whole new set of OKRs. Um, that would be insane. So, so really what I try to do is, is I have, you know, three objectives that are typically, I, I try to keep for an entire year. And they're very high level objectives, uh, but they are really the North Star that every person should be working on. And then our KRs change, you know, every quarter, every half year. Uh, but then all the tactics are the things that are constantly changing. Yeah. So for example, you know, um, influencer marketing is something that we are, we, we just spun up and it's been really successful for us. And so that is a tactic that is new, but very, very important. So we might dial down, for example, a certain paid channel so we can dial up another paid channel. Um, we might try, you know, uh, spin up SEO. And then after sort of a quarter, we're going to look at that and evaluate the results and say, hey, is this worth it? Is this worth continuing investing in? Or, hey, we're seeing some seeds here that some of our content's really interesting, but maybe actually we should think about putting it into you know, syndication. Mm. And so it, it's the, the overall objectives, the sort of overall goals are the same, but there are so many different channels and tactics um, and new things to try that I want. I never want people to just do the same things over, over again. And even, for example, with webinars, you know, we are uh, like I would consider if we said, you know, we used to do hour long webinars and I was like, why are we always doing hour long webinars? Can we try five minute webinars? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Can we try 10 minute webinars? Can we try record it, simulate live? And so my team just has this amazing, um, they're, they're incredibly creative and they have such a spirit of creativity and innovation. And so they're always trying these new tactics uh, that I think are just fantastic. And that's what I want to facilitate. And they are all much smarter than I am and do their job much better. And so I really just want to create an environment where they feel comfortable trying things and they feel like empowered uh, and required to try things. And then I just let them try them. That's brilliant. And it's an amazing culture. You know, I was looking to run a, a test testing lab for want of a better word, but it was about that. It was about how can we find things that we're not doing that might work or improve things that we're doing. And it was, it was incredibly like there was so much freedom, but, but what we learned through it was actually you needed, the, you needed structure. You actually needed structure in it. And, we, we kind of created a framework. And one of the questions 
we had within that was what decision could we make? So if we, when we do this thing, what decision can we make if it works or it doesn't work? Because you need, like, we felt we needed to know that we weren't going to make a bad decision, you know, by, by mm-hmm. understanding the metrics that, that happened. And it's, um, but to have that across the team, because that was kind of pocketed in one group. And I think, you know, some yeah. people are like, oh, look, look at them. They get to do all this, you know, new stuff. But you have that across the whole team, which is a bigger yeah. culture to, to create. Like, it's amazing. Well, I just it, like always come back to what I said, psychological safety, which is people are 100% going to fail. Like, it, of course, they, and, and most of it's going to fail and making it really clear that I don't mind that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind if something is successful as long as we learn from it, yeah. we take those learnings and we try something else. And so, and, and we're really honest about it. So that, that's, to me, what is the important part of it is that everybody should feel this excitement. And like, none of us got into marketing so we could just do the same thing over and over and over again and never change and never, why would we do that? Um, and so I think it's, it should be really fun and exciting liberating for people to think about how do they, you know, and, and I think what is exciting is people go to conferences, they read up on things, they come to me with ideas, they get really excited and I'm like, Yes, of course. Do it. That's Try amazing. It. That is amazing. Because like the amount of time you go to like a conference or something and you get, you're so, you know, pumped from the whole thing. You're like, this, I mean, we should do this. And then you come back and you're like, well, no, the budget's not there. We so that's an amazing, honestly, it's an amazing culture and thing to have. And so Calendly team, you're lucky if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so don't tell my boss this. But one thing, one important thing is I have, you know, I have my own little slush fund. Yes. Um, and I back and that's that's what we use yeah. right so when people come to me and say hey i want to experiment with a new technology or a new it may, I, I have the money um and, uh, and i learned this from my, my old boss and um and it's a really it's a super super important yeah. uh it's it's a really important component of this because i agree with you if, if you never have the budget to try things if, if every single cent is allocated i think what's also really important is you know is me working really closely with my ceo and my cfo to help them understand what we're doing and have them understand that some of our money will absolutely like, you know, um, will be the the cash machine, right? So yeah. this percent of our budget, you give me this money, I will guarantee you this money out. And some percentage of our budget is totally experimental, but we think it's really important. Um, and that's really important for them to have that understanding so that um, there there are no concerns down the road or, or they understand that not every single dollar is, being spent on paid ads and that there yeah. is room for experiment. Yes, no, a hundred percent. And just that kind of, um, yeah, that belief and trust they have in you that you're not wasting money. Um, this, I wanted to have so much more, but I, I do want to ask you about a LinkedIn post that you wrote, um, a, a while ago and it was advice to salespeople, right? I thought this was brilliant because like, I'm not a salesperson, but you know, there's a lot of salespeople out there and I think marketers who work with salespeople pass this on. So you said in an average week, and I think you're underestimating this, by the way, I receive about 100 emails, 40 calls and 50 LinkedIn uh, connection requests from salespeople. And that you're, and you said, actually, I'm incredibly empathetic to salespeople because you understand the role. But you said that at the, you, here's the big tip. I don't actually direct how my budget is spent. I set the priorities for the team, which we've talked about and the team allocate the budget. So you were kind of, your advice to them was like, actually, I'm not who you need to speak to. Yes. It, it didn't help. <laughs> I still get the same number of LinkedIn connections and emails and phone calls. Um, but I tried, I did my best. But I thought it was wonderful because like, you know, again, so many, you know, people are like, well, you know, we got to think about the, you know, all the buyers and, you know, all the people. And we yeah. all do it like in marketing, we're like, well, who's, who's going to influence the buying decision? And I remember Re, like talking to like senior leaders in in and outside an organization. And one of the things that came up for me was that like that, they don't make the decision and often they don't know the tools that are most current and most of interest. And they look to their team, bring them those exactly what you've just taught, those ideas. I mean, we have at least 50 tools just within our own team. And there's so many more that are coming every day. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of marketing and sales tools. There's no possible way that I can understand all of them. But my, you know, but if you think about all the people within my organization, you know, I've, I've got someone that is just responsible for lifecycle emails. 
they are thinking about it every single day and they absolutely shouldn't be aware of what are, what's the latest and greatest technology. And so, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, if it's a large purchase, I approve it. But my job isn't to go into excruciating nitty gritty detail yeah. about whether, you know, we need a usage based email tool or we need this other tool or I just that's not that's not a good use of anybody's time. And also, I trust my team. Um, and so when they come to me and say, I expect them to have done their due diligence. And so when they come to me and they say, hey, I'd like to have this tool. This is the reason why this I'm going to ask a lot of questions about, you know, what have you what have you done? What have you looked at? What's the impact? Do we have the resources to implement it? Mm. I'm going to ask them a lot of questions to make sure that they've done their due diligence. But if they have, I'm going to prove it. Um, and and it's just I to me, having a CMO make a tooling decision and pushing it down on a team is a recipe for that team never using it yes. because they were not already in and it's not part of their workflow. So I never Sometimes I have made the mistake of suggesting a tool and I realized that that is a mistake because then my team thinks That's that I'm telling them to do it. And that, that has, was, was very unsuccessful. And so I am very clear now uh, that, you know, like, hey, I, I, I saw this or I heard about this great tool. I am not telling you to use it, but you may want to look at it. And if you're interested, you reach out. And so I learned my lesson. <laughs> That's right. But it, and it's so true. It's, you know, you, it's, it's like going back to those initial conversations. People are, oh God, no, that's what they think. But it's actually, you know, anyone listening to this will get, I think, the point that you're actually not like, <laughs> like that. You're just like, I'm, it's just an idea. <laughs> I, don't, just an idea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. And that's something, you know, as we talk. And again, I think I remember from that, that festival marketing event, um, you know, you have that, and we yeah, again we talked about the curiosity, and you know, you do, you don't you're not standing here going, I know it all. I guess I'm CRO of Calendly, so therefore, yes. look at me. That would be silly. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and I think that that's uh, it's something that I'm actually incredibly passionate about, and I and I did um, I, you know, I I've done a lot of speaking about it internally and externally about imposter syndrome. I know it's a very overused expression, but. It's something that's I'm really passionate about. It's something very near and dear to my heart because, you know, I I I when I was younger and I saw people that were more experienced and senior, I assumed that they knew all the answers. Mm. I assumed that I was the only one that did it. And it's only as I have gotten more senior and I engage and interact with lots and lots of very successful people that I realized that nobody has all the answers yeah. and nobody feels that they have all the answers. And that was very liberating for me. And I think um and also there were some you know, particular books and speakers like Brittany Brown. And they're just people that that kind of expressed this this feeling that I always had inside me um, that really, uh, really liberated me and changed my life in terms of being vulnerable and being like, I don't know the answers. And it, it is an amazing, wonderful, powerful thing to just say, I don't know. And but let's figure it out together yeah. and let's make mistakes. And it's OK. It's OK to not know. Um, it's a it's a really wonderful, wonderful thing to say that. It, yeah, hundred percent. And then even you know that I think that leadership thing of, you know, when you're in meetings or whatever, and and you know you you see it where you know the most senior person is the first one to share the opinion, then everybody like it. It's so, and I've experienced that, and everyone's like, and then yeah. afterwards, or everyone's messaging each other, going, "I don't agree with that. Neither do I." Well, why aren't you saying something? It's like because I'm know. terrified. Isn't it the worst? Yeah. I know. Uh, and, it is. It's a. Uh, it's something that I, it's so interesting because I don't think of myself as the most senior person in the room. I think of myself as just a person that is part of the marketing team, and so I really do have to be very thoughtful about my voice. And I am. I am very direct, and I have strong opinions, and I have to be really. And and even one of the, the things that I've seen the most is when we do, um, you know, sort of uh, post interview assessments. So you know, we're interviewing somebody, and then we all get together and talk to, talk about them. You know, I always have to be last. And that's something that I have learned is really important is I let everybody else speak. And then because um, I, I don't want my opinion to influence anybody else. So it's just being really careful about that um, and being really thoughtful about it, that other people may see me differently than I see myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? You kind of have to remember, yeah, remember to forget or something. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, no, I'm not the person I was, you know, 20 years ago. It's a different people see me differently and it's kind of the the impact you can have but it's you know can then be a positive impact and um, look incredibly busy 
job, no doubt. And, you know, people all over the world. Um, and where and how do you find time and what do you do to, to relax and free time in your Calendly? Yeah, I'd say I have a ton of free time. Uh, so I've got two boys, uh, 12 and 13, and they are, um, I- I'd say that working from home has been amazing because the I I have blended my work and personal life in a way that maybe other people don't wouldn't want, but that's what really works for me. And so what I love is when my kids come home at three o'clock, you know, they they always open the door to say hi to me and I get to spend a few minutes with them learning about their day and they always complain about something, usually about each other. But, you know, it's those moments that are really valuable to me. And so maybe I'll, and then maybe at four o'clock, I'll jump off for uh, one of my kids' baseball games and literally I'll be taking phone calls from the baseball game. Um, but like that totally works for me. And I think that that, uh, and and so I really enjoy the fact that I can have that flexibility and maybe once I get home at, at seven, I'll, I'll jump back on. Sorry, I'm talking about fun stuff. I went back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I spend a lot of time watching my kids' sports. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge, and then I'm I'm a big baker, so Are that you? is that is my relaxation. Yes, yeah. so I love to bake. I totally got into it during COVID. My husband is celiac, and he is was always so sad because he could never find baked goods that he could eat. Um, yeah. And so I just started learning all of these sort of ways to mimic all the baked goods that he loves, but in a gluten free way. So that's kind of my thing. No way! And oh my god, baking is like. I, I love cooking, but I'm terrible at baking. It's the precision of it that gets me. I'm more of a, a bit of this and a bit of that and see what happens. And sometimes it works and most it, often it doesn't. Uh, don't don't ever let me bake with you because that would drive me crazy. I, <laughs> I love like I I love the um and I, I I'm such a perfectionist that I just love to get better. And so I take all of these baking classes and all these decorating classes. So that's been really my fun thing is learning how to make like really beautiful you know, holiday cookies yeah. and cake. And um, so that's been my fun thing is just trying to get better at that. Yeah, mine look like they're, you know, some sort of modern art or someone broke them or something. <laughs> that's my excuse. But uh, as long as you've read, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, I'm not even sure they do. <laughs> uh, Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time out today to chat to me. I've been really looking forward to this. And you, you had said to me, when you joined Calendar, you said, no, I will do this. It just you'd only started. And so uh, thank you so much for for joining me on That's Like Home Marketing. My pleasure. This is a lot of fun. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I truly meant it when I said, Calendly team, you have a great leader. I'm sure you know that. I've seen both sides of the coin and approach to leadership that Jessica shared today. And maybe it's the obvious choice, but I want to work for the Jessica Gilmartins of this world all day long. Trust, empathy, ability to try new and exciting things, structure to make that happen. A culture that abhors retaliation gives people a voice. It amazes me when I see leaders that behave in the opposite way to this. And trust me, I have, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't listen to this podcast. Well, I really hope this was an uplifting episode for you. And as a leader, helps you think about how you're approaching things from culture to even practical things like the channel idea. And as someone entering marketing or starting the journey, gives you an idea of the kind of leaders that will help you in your career. Well, if you did enjoy the episode, please do rate, review or share. For me, Connor Byrne, until the next episode of That's What I Call Marketing. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to The Indie List for sponsoring today's show. Visit theindielist.ie to find out more. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Are you facing the maze of global expansion? Diplomat introduces the diplomacy model, a cost-effective, innovative approach to navigating the complexities of your brand's presence in international markets. Visit diplomat.agency 